Okay, let's do this. Uh, my name is Sami Kallinen. Uh, this is me uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, here are some facts about me. I won't linger on these, but I wanted to say that uh, I work at 8-Bit Cheap in Helsinki. We build data and analytics heavy applications for big brands, my data, graphics, and so forth. Retailers, esports, and that kind of things are our customers. I should also say this will not be a technical talk. I will mostly talk about community side of things. And um, the, what I'm going to present is based on interviews with, that I've done with these nice people in the community I'm going to be talking about. And the community is Cycloge, the data science community for Clojure. And the question is how to build a Clojure data science community, what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, why do we need another data science platform? Um, Clojure is a platform that handles data and exploration very well, data exploration and also code exploration very well, and offers some answers for uh, incidental complexity that can plague some systems. Um, this is why some of us have been looking at making Clojure a platform for, for data science. And there are good reasons why the simplicity of Clojure can make it into a good alternative for, for data science. And let's look at um, let's look at a little bit where we are currently. Here's a list of libraries you can use when if, when you're working with data science. There's there has been many throughout the years. The pink ones are in active um, development or maintenance. Um, but something interesting has been happening recently. A lot of missing pieces were suddenly there. If we think about the data science uh, stack, we now have a way of writing transformations of table-like structures that data scientists like to like to do in a convenient way, much like dplyr in R or pandas in Python. If you like, we have visualization. We have many many different libraries, uh, including interop with both R and uh, Python ecosystems. If we would want to cherry pick some of those. Plus, it's uh, blazingly fast. So here's a benchmark that Andrew Kong recently did. And you can see the closure stuff is faring very well. A lot of this is due to the work that Chris, um, Chris Nuremberger has been doing with the tech ML data type libraries uh, that, that do many clever things, but they give us speed as well. Um, so if we have the stack there, what happens next? How, and I think the interesting question is how the data science of closure can meet the world of the data scientist. So I decided to take a little bit of a product mindset to look at, uh, look at this question and how we could uh, facilitate uh, the creation of a user, user culture. Um, the first thing I did is that I invited five uh, uh, people who work with data but who don't know closure to user tests. I give you um, a few samples here so you can see what it looked like. I started all of the, the tests with asking them where you would start if you would want to find out about how to work with closure. Let's look at one of a uh, little sample of one of those uh, those uh, tests. I would just write down closure. Uh... Uh, and data science to Google. And mm -hmm. I would find out what is the closure data science toolkit. Okay, I opened that to a different tab. There's a Reddit. I do not understand the language in Reddit. I don't read it. <laughs> oh, there's even a closure data science website. Cool. Uh, towards data science, these usually are good articles. Or, well, there is a variance, but ah. Yeah, even machine learning. Okay, so I would get a, okay, there is a discussion, SIP pandas. Uh, okay. Well, I don't, this is maybe too much for me. Uh, uh -huh. uh, not secure website, uh, do not fancy it. Um, quite a lot of texts. I would just need a, like a summary. What, what is it about? How can I use it? Is it a language? Do I, what kind of UI can I use? 
do I just need to go to the terminal or what is this? Okay, so that was the beginning of one of them. Let's look at another one, um, uh, which is not from the beginning, but it's uh, somewhere uh, later. Great, but this looks like welcome to the 90s. The only thing missing here is like that guy digging and saying like, <laughs> we have under construction. I, I don't know if it's conf confusing if I speak here as well, but I have to say we had the, the refreshing of the site on the backlog for a long time mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. Have some uh, connection problems. Okay, tutorials. But this is actually, this looks so old, so I would like to go down here on the page and see when it's updated, but it actually it says 2020, so maybe it's just somebody who likes this old style. Um, so there's quite, quite many takeaways, of course, from the five hours, but I won't spend too much time here now, but it's, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, from the per uh, beginner perspective, currently the situation is neither simple nor easy. But um, one can also make the reasonable argument, as, as many actually have done, and there's a lot of discussion in our community as well, that closure is not really meant for beginners. It's a tool for intermediate programmers with a couple of years of computer science behind them. And um, uh, this is, of course, a very reasonable uh, analysis, but I would say also from, especially from the data science perspective, uh, it is not enough. I mean, we need to grow the community much bigger than we are to be viable and sustainable. We, we basically need to be popular. Um, I also looked at not only the sort of technical perspective of finding, learning about culture, but I was interested in the community side as well. And if there were sort of onboarding and findability SEO problems with the technical side, there was very much so also on the on the uh, social side. But let's say we fix these. I also think and and learned that it's it's super important to work so uh, that we will get a better to use product jargon retention rate for the for the community. We use. Um, a uh, platform called Zulip uh, for it's a chat platform where actually the community exists and it, Zulip has been super important for for creating the community in the first place but I did some uh, simple data analysis uh, to see kind of how um, yeah let's see uh, there is some analytics here let's look at the code So I loaded first the messages from the API, and then I, here I start to build functions that uh, help pl the plotting aspect that I'm going to do soon. And now I do some pre-processing using these kind of pipes with this uh, this transformation library that I was mentioning before. And this is the part that all of the plots are going to do. So I do a kind of a function where I can do the basic things first, and it's I do some create some new columns and do some processing there. And now here I test it first that it works. And then I start to build the first first plot. And here with the head, you can always see a few rows and see that the shape is the way you want to do it. Here I aggregate. Here I actually do a count of messages, um, do some color stuff. I transform the thing. Then I realized that I forgot to wrote, write this function that combines the data with the Vega schema that I'm using here. And now I have some, some stuff on the screen already and the labels were not correct. So I use just basic data uh, for uh, data manipulation functions to to work with the also the visual because Vega is just uh, it's a schema it's it's data so we can we can work on it very familiarly okay and if you look at this data you can see here this is just the post count on the community in this uh, cyclos part of the community uh, in Zulip and yeah it started here end of uh, eighteen and there was some some discussion. It's been growing. This peak here has to do with that we had here end of February. We had a had a, a little conference, really uh, um, uh, a meetup in in Berlin, which led to new members coming, and there was a lot of discussions uh, 
after that. And here is a slump, which I guess partly is a kind of a corona slump, which started to get pretty bad here. Um, there might be some summer going on here as well, of course. And then it's nicely starting to grow again. But then I wanted to see also by unique users, how much activity do we have? Because discussions is one thing. So then I start a new new pipe like this. Uh, I, I do do some manipulations and again, uh, group by, here I count the distinct users. I check check some the form again, the shape again, that it looks good. I transform it to map, then I copy the, the sort of what I had done there in the in the previous plot, uh, the sort of specifications for how the plot should look like. And here you see the unique user counts. And, and I mean, it's it's still small, it's very small, but it's it's I think it has a healthy curve of growth there. But then I was interested in the, um, a, in a sort of distribution of how many, how many posts people post, uh, if you have one user, how many, and here I'm, I'm doing doing transformations to get that. Eventually I will be using uh, another library to do the Vega plotting. This is uh, Chris Nuremberger's uh, Vega uh, TechVis library. And here we get a, it has some nice presets for colors and stuff. And and yes, so here we get, I, I filled it out because there was some users that had like uh, almost, it was more than a thousand posts but to get a bit of um, better better picture of the start part. So most of the users, of course, it's probably not unsurprising, it's probably not surprising, but but most of the users only post one time or two or three times. So here I think probably the shape of this will be the same for all communities. But I think if we if we would put some effort into making the place welcoming, engaging people, we could sort of improve this retention rate a little bit to optimize the people who join us and who want to have, play with us. Okay. Um, so then the question is, how should we build a community? Um, I, as I said, I interviewed different uh, community members and asked what they thought. Let's look at a few of them, what uh, some insights from those, uh, uh, some ex excerpts and insights from those interviews. So I'll, I'll first uh, show a little clip with Karim Meyer. Um, um, who I think many of you know, she's a, a prof uh, she's a profile in the um, uh, in the closure community, and she also does a lot of work with data and data science, a lot of blogging, some excellent excellent work. So let's see what she has to say. You know, community is is a big word for lots of people coming to a place with different backgrounds and different needs. Uh, so. I think for a community to be, to be successful, it has to, you know, be open to addressing those needs of people coming in. So there's people that are beginning people that um, maybe want to learn about data science or they want to learn about closure, and they're going to have different needs than uh, people that already have a deep background in it that are coming for a specific reason. Um, so for the beginners, um, it's got to be an open, friendly pa place that, you know, they, <laughs> that that people would feel welcome, which I think, it, you know, Cyclos has done a fantastic job of being open and wel welcoming. And then for... Um, she goes on to talk about uh, the needs of the more experienced. I thought it was super interesting how she sort of formulates the beginner experience and the needs of the community. But let's look at another uh, community member thinking about issues around the needs of, of uh, uh, the community members. This is Tomáš. When we were doing uh, clogies, someone, I don't remember who, uh, was willing to contribute. And uh, it was really, really easy, easy, uh, easy stuff. And I did it personally. Uh, did it personally uh, in one another another upgrade, and I remember that it was a uh, it was a mistake from my from my uh, from my um, from current perspective uh, because this person was discouraged to contribute because he wanted he wanted to go this path 
as a beginner path if you wanted to contribute to see how how it looks like and uh, and i remember when i i did it uh, he was uh, upset and it was uh, and he he named it as, uh, he, i wanted to make it i wanted to contribute if you not and not willing to for contributors so just say it yeah mm -hmm. so uh so uh, being open and uh, creating the country community means also that every person is open for uh, mistakes and for uh, mistakes of the beginners. Yeah. Uh, some super insightful there, I think. I should say that Tomasz Soleil is uh, also one of the hidden heroes of the data science story on Clojure. Uh, through his many important contributions, most recently the tablecloth library, which I was using there to manipulate data in that uh, coding se session earlier. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. It's uh, kind of a dplyr like uh, API on top of the TMD library, the fast, uh, fastness of, of our data ecosystem, which have been done by Chris. Let's listen to Chris uh, talk about community. Um, what uh, in this clip he's answering to a question when I asked what what advice would you give uh, to people who would want to start the open source community now, and and this is what he said. I'm gonna. I would tell them to be very nice all the time. I don't know how many times I've made this mistake. I don't think I've made it too often, but I have seen very very strong things said that were said by people in power uh technical experts and while i believe what they said was technically correct the heat and the tone of what they said just has a lasting negative effect on everybody who reads it and so it, it is it, you really if you're going to sign up for open source you really have to sign up to try to be diplomatic every day even when you are really frustrated and you see so clearly why someone's wrong or why someone is, you, a lot of times you see the emotional reasons why they're arguing with you, but if you argue with the emotional reasons, you'll make an enemy. And your words may live on the internet and those words may make more enemies that you don't even know yet. Or at least people who are like, you know, I just don't want to get into the drama. Again, I think super insightful. And I think most of us can recognize what he's talking about and somehow obvious, but somehow also something that we so easily overlook and forget. So I, I think there was quite a few in interesting and important points that uh, all, all of the people we just heard uh, raised in terms of understanding really the needs of the community. Why do people come and join the community? And I, um, um, I uh, there, there are, this is my top three. It's about learning. We join the communities because we're eager to learn. And so often we actually don't really um, focus on this. That's, that's really, we're focusing on the, on the technical sides, but really we are a learning platform. Of course, we want to contribute, make cool things. And we also want to hang out and it, and get new friends. And it should be nice when, when we do it and, and, and pleasant, uh, like any social interaction. Um, so if we pick the learning experience, I, I, I give you a short, short uh, overview of what, we're, what we are actually doing here. So you saw a little bit about the onboarding experience. There's a lot of problems there. Um, none of the people we tested really found the relevant things that should be our, our sort of uh, uh, tools to be used at this moment. But the, the good news is that we are very aware of this and we're busy with them. Uh, simple and easy. Of course, of course, we know that easy is uh, a relative and subjective word, um, but we might want to try to focus on the subjective easiness of beginners, because it's probably the only way we can grow as a community. Um, there's of course the Zulip. I already mentioned it, and it's a brilliant platform. A shout out to Gert, who has been helping behind the scenes to make it make it work. Um, but of course, there also we found out in the use test. We there's a lot of things we can do to to make it more clear and more uh, work better. Um, tutorials are something that of course. Um, uh, kind of a no-brainer. Uh, we have actually been using the tutorials so far mostly to um, 
validate the gaps in the in the in the tooling so far but we are now very close to that sort of phase shift where um where we actually can start building them for future users study groups there's a lot of activity on this for daniel slutsky who is one of the sort of driving forces behind the community who's very patiently done a lot of work for the past couple of years and is is busy with uh, many of us other people as well organizing these study groups there's a half a dozen study groups organized every week where you can learn the stack and get deeper deeper understanding of the um of the situation but i should also focus uh, on uh, diversity and um, let's start by listening to jordan miller who is a self-taught clodurian and relatively recently joined the community not not enough women in tech there are not enough people of color in tech um there are you know judgments that people keep behind closed doors that uh, that show in their actions, but not uh, show negatively, I guess, through their actions, but they're, they aren't willing to talk about. And it, I, I think that people are doing good work because I can tell you when I first started in the Slack, uh, I think my first ever Slack post, I said something along the lines of, hey guys, I'm so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. And uh, Sean Corfield, the moderator of the Slack, had sent me a private message. And it was funny because it was, uh, I think he was doing it just very uh, uh, reactively, just used to. He, he didn't realize that I was a female. Mm -hmm. um, and he, had, he sent me a message, hey, please try to refrain from using guys. Not everybody in this chat identifies as a guy. Not everybody is a guy. And I responded you know what? You're right, Sean, being a few, you know, because I don't allow, because. I, I should say I reached out to Sean also to, because of this clip. And, and one of the comments he made was that he's only one of the, uh, now I forget, was it seven or nine other, other moderators or total moderators? But yeah, it's a lovely story. Props to uh, Sean there for, for uh, doing, doing this. Um, if, if, you, if we, um, if we need any any sort of uh, motivation why diversity matters, uh, besides of the ethical and, and the dimensions, uh, quick googling uh, gave these results. Um, diverse teams are smarter. Um, uh, when you have diverse teams, the social majority alters their behavior, resulting in a more uh, accurate group thinking. Uh, the diverse teams uh, process facts more carefully. And the classic one is, of course, that diverse teams are more creative and innovative. So what's there not to like? Um, I think we have a lot to learn from the R community here. Um, I won't read the whole, you can look at the quote, read the quote for yourself. But the point is that uh, Julia Silge, who is one of the sort of prominent members of the R community, describes how surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised she was when she uh, joined the R community by um, how how good the situation in terms of diversity was there. And they are doing very well. And it's also due to some systematic works, work throughout the years. But why, what I wanted to also sort of bring up is that I think diversity, I mean, even though diversity is important in from any many different perspectives, it's also for us in data science, it, we even have, I mean, it's even more important because the data data science community is super diverse and maybe one reason has to do with the fact that our community for instance is is a is famous for being the pro a programming community that has very few programmers in they're mostly they can be physicians biologists marketeers there are many other things but they don't have the sort of computer science background and these are the people we want to reach out to and, and, and invite to join our community. So we need to be very careful how we, how we uh, think about this and how we, um, how we make accommodations for, for being diverse and really, really focus on it, I think. Okay, if, if the, I should do a conclusion, I, I think I, I would say that building an open source software 
uh, or uh, building an open source software community as much of a social and psychological problem as it is a technological one. And of course, this is in a way obvious. When I talk to the people who I interviewed, all of them agreed, of course. But I think we forget it. It's it's obvious in theory, but we don't think about it. We should focus much more on it when we actually build our communities, when we interact and think about how how can we work on the community and make this, develop it from this perspective as well. Okay, there's a lot more to talk about this, of course, but um, I think this is enough for now. Um, of course, I, I should do a shout out. We need help and the closure uh, closure, uh, closure community, of course. Um, if you're interested in data, it's a super fantastic place to wor uh, learn. But I mean, and don't worry about it if you don't know it. We need all kinds of help. And um, for instance, if you know Closure Script, as you saw, we have some issues with our websites. But there's also other aspects of the sort of stack that uh, would find Closure Script very, very useful. So please, please join us. Um, even if you don't know how to code, if you see this video on the internet, um, there's a lot of things you can do if you want to contribute and, and hang out. Um, you find us at the data science stream at the Zulip um, platform, as I said. Um, there's the URL. Come there. Ask also more about the technical stuff there that I omitted from from this. Uh, it wasn't in the scope of this presentation. Remember to when you get in, you need to manually first subscribe to the data science channel before you find the discussions. That's something I know learned in the user tests that a lot of people have difficulties in that but fantastic i thank you for your time um yeah uh, hope to see you in the uh, in the q a in a bit <laughs>